You have to stand out. Too many people, and it's shocking to me that so many people, especially with the advent of social media and texting, and everybody wants to fit in. Fit in? That just seems hideous to me. I want to, you know, I want to stand out like a sore thumb and be as different as anybody else. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, how the creator of P90X went from being an out of shape, yeah, you heard that right, out of shape, out of work actor, to becoming one of the most famous personal trainers to the stars, and the life lessons he's learned from losing friends, losing big contracts, and battling a crippling illness. So imagine it's 20 years ago and a much, much younger version of you is up in the middle of the night watching TV. And as you flip through the channels, we used to have to do that, passing reruns of Married with Children, you stumble upon an infomercial for a home exercise routine that looks like it will change your life. That is how I was originally introduced to today's guest, Tony Horton. Like countless others, I saw those late night P90X infomercials on Fox 29 or whatever local station was playing it. Of course, I never imagined that one day I'd have the chance to dig into Tony's personal story. Now from the outside, it looks like he just got lucky. But as I learned more about Tony, I came to realize that his story is actually one of finding your true self and what happens once you really embrace it. You can be screwed up six ways to Sunday, but if you're self-aware, there's hope. If ah. there's hope, there's change, right? And so, you know, and this takes time. I mean, at 38, dude, I, 38, I was, I was not in a good, I did not have a podcast. I didn't have anybody looking at me. I was, you know, drinking beer and eating pizza and watching ball games. And uh, I lived in the same apartment for 21 and a half years. Like, and I had the same carpet. I have the same carpet in that apartment for 21 and a half years. I, I had, you know, my car got broken into every once in a while. I was in a, I lived in a funky neighborhood and I was, you know, I didn't, I was, this is who I was in my twenties in my thirties and in my early forties, you know, and whatever, going, doing my seminars. And a lot of it is luck too. You know what I mean? A lot of it is for me to be in the position I'm in. I mean, I knock on wood all the time because I feel very blessed that things turned out pretty damn amazing because they because a lot of my friends because my friend college marriage kids work house money savings right that's everybody else i knew horton not any of those things <laughs> struggling for the words uh right no not, not any, any of those things, things right <laughs> just like and then my friend's like man because when things started to turn around they would everybody would come to me holy crap dude we thought for sure you would you know, you would, you were going to be homeless or you were going to be, you're what we call a late like, bloomer, <laughs> very late, very late bloomer, which gives okay. other people hope when you're young and you're upbeat and you're optimistic. Like everybody's on the same level, like high school and college, right? There's nobody. And then, Oh, you're off to Yale and I'm going to the community college or I'm not going to college. And then you'll start putting, you start putting yourself in a category, right? And then you get people who are really successful and maybe they, Maybe they're level-headed and they're cool and they're honest and they're not, but maybe they're arrogant. Maybe they've turned into, you know, a-holes, who knows, right? And so we all, and then as you get in your 30s and 40s, like, wow. And if you haven't made it yet, based on your on your thoughts about what that's supposed to look like, then you can get really depressed, man. You can get really, you can really get hard on yourself, you know what I mean? But I mean, for a kid with a C minus average, who had a pretty bad speech impediment, who like you, didn't exercise, was not athletic hated physical pain, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more, I'm tougher now than I was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. I, I was a fragile kid and it took, you know, I just, I decided to be the tortoise and very slowly I kept moving forward. Right. And then what, was, what drove that change in you? I hated being poor. I hated being out of shape. I hated, yeah. hated being sad. I hated yeah. being single. I hated living in a crappy little apartment with a view of a 
convalescent home behind me. And I was in my 30s and then about to be in my 40s. So the, my late 20s, most of my 30s was a combination of partying, <laughs> chasing girls, barely able to pay my bills, stacking credit card debt up to here, but also reading all, all these books and trying to make, you know, a tiny little changes here and there. And eventually, the I don't need to smoke weed anymore. I don't need to drink alcohol anymore. I, I don't, the gym, going to the gym once in a while just to meet women and, and, and get big arms was not a reason to go anymore. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, and, and I got my first client, you know what I mean? I was, I was an actor and I was starting to, my act, my agents like, dude, you gotta, if you want more, I don't know if she said, dude, but she said, Mr. Horton, you should probably start exercising because that will help you get more work in this town. So I, I, I have an agent. That's cool. You know, Johnny Carson had an agent. I have an agent, probably not the same quality agent, but I just thought this person was a God. And so I just did what she said and I got in great shape. And so my boss noticed and my boss said, Hey, I'm overweight and miserable. Can you help me do that? And I said, okay. And so I got my boss in shape and, uh, when we were all, you know, I was a PA over at 20th Century Fox, you know, on the lot there looking at movie stars. And and my boss was this guy, Harlan Goodman, who was trying to make movies, he never did. But I got him in great shape. And then he went back to make, you know, managing music. And then there he was walking down the hallway of East End Management on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And in the other direction, there's Tom Petty and Tom sees Harlan. He's smoking a cigarette and he says, hey, Harlan. Holy crap, you look fantastic. I'm going on tour and I'm fat. Nobody likes a fat rocker, man. So so Harlan gave Tom Petty my phone number. And I didn't know that. So the phone rings and my roommate picks it up and he goes, hello. And Tom Petty says, well, hey, it's, my name is Tom Petty. And of course, Bob looks at me, covers the phone and says, I think it's JP downstairs screwing around. So Bob hung up the phone on Tom Petty. <laughs> it was Dory, it's in the book. So he phoned me, hey, we got disconnected. So Bob goes, I think this is actually, what? Hello, I'm a friend of Harlan Goodman's. I'm fat and I'm going on tour. Can you help me? So I went to Tom's house the next day. I had him for four months. He's wearing sleeveless shirts and vests without shirts. And he's jacked up and he's like, he thinks he's Bruce Springsteen. And then the phone rang off the hook. Right. And so I went, oh, I better learn how to really train people. So I took a few classes. I got certified. So then, you know, for a while there, it was Tom Petty, Billy Idol, Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics. Um, no, it was Billy Idol first, then Tom Petty, Annie Lennox, Stephen Stills. Couldn't help Stephen. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. And then when 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 Bruce was in town, I, I trained Bruce. Hey, Tony, I trained him, him and Patty ski out for his wife. So I was keeping rock and roll from the 60s and 70s alive. But I was my 30s, though. I was yeah. all my 30s. But that was that was me building my persona. Right. And I'm, I'm doing stand up comedy. Not funny. But getting up there at three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, not three. The clubs were closed at three. But, you know, I mean, I was the last guy to get on. I got it. I'm going out to Pasadena doing my three minutes. You know, what yeah. I mean? <laughs> doing my you know, I was I was a trained street performer. So I would combine funny lines with my physicality. And, you know, I thought I was, I thought I was Jim Carrey and it was fun. I had a little group of comics and we would go around and do these open mic nights. And then we do these things. And then of course I'm taking my acting classes and skiing study classes and I'm part of second city LA. And so, you know, I wanted to be an actor. That's what I wanted to be, but I, Oh, I'm making a living over here as a carpenter, as a pantomime, as a trainer. So, you know, it was a hodgepodge to pay my bills. But that's what I mean, that's what I was doing. And I know part of what your podcast is, is how do you how do you live at the edge? How do you push, you know, hey, you can work for the man and you can go and sit in your cubicle and you can crunch numbers and maybe you're pretty good at that. And that's what you went to college for. And you can support your family. And that's all really swell. But you're a miserable son of a bitch because really what you want to do is own a bike shop. All right. So what this is what I was. I was like, I want to be an actor, but I got to be this trainer guy. Oh, and I get to hang out with Bruce Springsteen and Tom Petty and and Sean Connery. Submarines don't react to all the bullets. Anyway, it was a, a cool life, even though I wanted to be a movie star or a comic. But being a comic is hard. I just didn't have the I didn't have the wherewithal to, to do that for another five years. Do you, do you remember the moment or, or maybe I, I have to assume you had this. Do you remember the moment where all of these different things that you've done all came together and you're like, oh, 
that's why all of these different things, that's how they serve me. Because I think often people feel like tasting everything, trying everything, doing everything is like not the right way to live. Like pe- like grownups pick something and they do it and they commit. And then you have these artistic types who just taste and try everything. But at a certain point, they all come together in this Venn diagram. They all overlap where you're like, all of these past experiences serve me now here today. Do you, do, did you have one of those moments? Well, you're you're you know you're a master or jack you're a master of something or a jack of all trades. The problem is with what what I was doing is there's a lot more fails. You know what I mean? Like if you're doing twenty five different things, fail, 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 right? Because you're not really focusing on you're not as myopic as maybe if somebody who's like mm, I want to be an engineer, I'm going to go to school for that, and I'm going to get part of a firm, and I'm an engineer, and I do that, and then at the end I get a gold watch, and I retire, and I go to Miami Beach, and I, I stare at the sand. You know what I mean? That's one way to go. I mean, that's just one out of a million ways to go. My thing was dabble, 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 dabble. You know what I mean? And and like I, I read a book, Keith Ellis's book, The Magic Lamp. And The Magic Lamp helped me focus a little, a little bit, you know, because one of the lessons was write down 20 things that you would do if they somebody just handed it to you. Astronaut, movie star, politician, you know, all, all the greatest jobs in the world. And then write another list if you're work, willing to work your ass off to get them. And now and then you kind of like you take the two lists and you go, oh, astronaut or comic. All right, I'm not going to be an astronaut comic. And then you go all the way down. The and all of a sudden, if you do that a couple of times, the same two or three things pop up. And so then I, that helped me kind of focus. Okay, where do I got to put my energy? What kind of books do I re- need to read? Who do I need to hang out with? I got to stop doing all these other things because they're just leading to nowhere. But the, the, to the end, your, your question is, I would say somewhere between Power 90 and P90X. Because I I had a show on play on the Playboy Channel called 360, and I was a co-host with with uh, with Shannon Tweed, and it was great. It was three cameras, and we were doing these funny opening bits. You know what I mean? Where she drives her car through the garage and this whatever, and we're doing the you know, like you know we went to the LA Zoo and did some funny. I mean, it was really fun because I got to apply all this acting class stuff to an actual TV show. I mean, it was the Playboy channel, but it was a popular channel. I, we, I heard that we were huge in women's prisons around the country. Who knew? And um, uh, so, you know, you're, you're with a co-host and three cameras and you're jumping around trying to find the teleprompter and talking to her. It was a, a great learning lesson. And then, you know, I was back and forth in Minneapolis going, working for Nordic Track. And I was doing a lot of their, you know, I didn't let my, I wasn't allowed to let my personality out. Hi, I'm Tony Horton. And welcome to the line of Nordic Track Fitness products. Today, we're going to spend three and a half hours putting this piece of shit together. It's going to be fun. You know what I mean? It was that kind of thing. And so Carl, who, you know, the CEO of Beachbody, he, he saw that, oh, wow, I can walk and chew gum. I know, I know I'm a certified trainer, but I also have a personality because everybody knows that exercise is hard. Nobody wants to freaking do it because most trainers are pretty... <sighs> They're not, you know, they're not entertainers. They're, they're, you know, okay, we're going to do push-ups, and this is what your form should be, all right? Or they're right. really soft. I mean, I. <laughs> that's the I other mean, thing. More, they're like super more. soft and forgiving. I had this breakthrough last February. Now I'm I'm 38. You know, like a little late in life. Youngster, you are. Uh, yeah, I, I I just started strength training this year. This year, I just started strength training, and. Hmm. It hurts like hell. And I turned to my wife and I was like, this hurts. And she's like, it's supposed to. I've hired personal trainers before. No one had the clarity my wife had <laughs> where, where they like, I'd be like, this really hurts. They'd be like, oh, okay, you know, don't push yourself too hard. You don't want to hurt yourself. It's like, people are soft. What happens is a lot of trainers, like you got, you got, your, you got your, uh, your drill sergeant types, right? That's a certain kind of vibe. And then you have other ones that are, you know, maybe they're soft or they're super cautious and they want to, you know, the, the, it's more about that weekly paycheck than really focusing on you getting in great shape in 12 weeks and then going off. Like people who say, I've been going to my therapist for 45 years. Oh, you're still a psycho. Okay. I don't know what they're doing over there, uh, but you might, might want to get a new one or stop. And what well, I don't know. You know what I mean? So my thing was, you know, I have to be a, a kind of a, a, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a mentor. I'm a coach. I'm a drill sergeant. I'm a therapist. You know what I mean? You have to understand, you have to like, and as a comic or anybody on stage, you have to know your audience, right? You're not doing uh, penis jokes at the convalescent home. You know what I mean? You're not talking about your, your newborn baby on the college circuit. These are things that you basic rules of the road. So, you know, when I was shooting 
power 90, I was pretty dry. All right, everybody, here we go. We're going to do a thing. And then when P90X came, of course, I had had the show on Playboy. I was going to Minneapolis doing that, doing stand-up, doing the acting classes. So when P90X came around, I mean, think about the time and energy and effort and, and years ahead of, you know, trying to figure out who I really was. And then P90X came around and, and you know, there were discussions. Hey, how, can I really kind of go for it here? Can I really be silly here? Can I just be myself here? And, you know, some people, sometimes you need to look for permission, right? So a good producer director would say, hey, man, if you go too far, because most performers, you have to. You have to help them to get there. With me, you had to, <laughs> you had to, <laughs> to bring you back down. That's actually you know something I, mean? I used that to say. Early in my career, oh, I want. I didn't want to offend anybody. I want to do anything wrong. I want to make everything straight. I want to make sure that I got all. You know what I mean? I was all about the queuing and everything. Else. But when P nine the X came around, I had a year of development. I knew every move like the back of my hand, so I could kind of relax. You know what I mean? I could kind of have some fun. So you know backing up like a pterodactyl and not don't smash your face and everybody beautiful, you know, whatever the crap that came out of my mouth, you know, and they would let me know, like I was doing some jokes that were probably that were maybe mildly inappropriate or too soon. So that no cut, dude, you can't, you can't do that joke yet. And I, then it turns out, especially now that everybody's woke, a lot of that, like a lot of some P90X stuff, people get offended. They don't think I'm funny. That's fine. You can't make everybody happy. But the big, the moment was the longest answer to your question ever, by the way, was between Power 90 and P90X. At that point, I was, I could, you know, I mean, I've, I've done a workout in front of 26,000 people in front of four cameras or 26,000. You know, I'm, I'm more comfortable on a stage in front of a camera than I am at a cocktail party. You know, I mean, that's just because I'm, I've been working at it for so damn long. I think when you're younger, you know, if I'm speaking to my younger audience or the people who haven't maybe tasted everything or tested everything, as I said, you think of yourself as something, right? You know, you, you were, you know, wanted to be an actor and then you wanted to be a comedian and then, you know, you became, a, you know, a personal trainer. But the through line to all of that is that at heart, you're a performer, whether you're performing for one, whether you're performing for 26,000, whether you're performing for the camera, whether you're performing on stage, whether you're performing in the boardroom. I mean, I like right now in talking to you, this is one like giant performance because it just seems to ooze out of you. Yeah, 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 you know. And, and I'm you, like this almost all the that, time unless I'm tired. <clears throat> no, I'm, what I was going to say is when you get to that, when you, when you figure out that, that, your zone of genius is like um, is like a skill set as opposed to a profession. Boy, can you move from one thing to the next really, really quickly? A lot of it has to do with, um, and this this is for anybody who's listening in. You know, you really gotta you gotta really hone your skills, and you gotta feel like you know what you're doing better than everybody else. And you also should probably figure out a way to do it differently than everybody else. You have to stand out. Too many people, and it's shocking to me. That so many people, especially with the advent of social media and texting, and everybody wants to fit in, fit in. That just seems hideous to me. I want to, you know, I want to stand out like a sore thumb and be as different as anybody else, which takes time to learn how to do that. You've got to certainly, um, you know, care less about the outcome, um, you know, uh, uh, and just be in the moment. Um and it also it also helps that you build a fairly decent vocabulary. You know, I mean, I can do impressions and I can do I can do silly voices and I can and I mean I don't have the greatest vocabulary in the world, but I'm I'm certainly no malaprop. Everyone knows Tony as the P90X guy, the guy with a lot of energy, the guy who's in killer shape. But what many people don't realize is that over the past few years, he's he's been hammered with one setback loss, and challenge after the next. First, he had a number of close friends who were in the 2017 Las Vegas shooting. And then the very next day, his good friend Tom Petty died from an accidental overdose. He was also in an ongoing negotiations with Beachbody, the company that helped him create his fitness empire. And things were not going very well. And on top of all of that, he became extremely ill, suffering from Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. 
Talk about doing hard things. For a man who was in his late 50s, early 60s, I don't know what kept him moving forward. Why he didn't just run out of energy and give up. You know, I mean, I was with Beachbody, the parent company who helped me create P90X, X2, 22-minute hardcore, all of it. You know, 20 years, we started in 99. And, you know, along the way, I ended up getting really sick. I ended up with something called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. And it shingles in your ear, which basically means shingles in your brain, which means you're going to affect a lot of the nerves, you know, vision, smell, sight, taste, balance, all these really critical nerves for you to be able to, for you to, be able to function in a day. And so, you know, one in a hundred thousand people who get shingles, get it in their ear and lucky me, jackpot, you know? So I was screwed up six ways to Sunday. I lost 25 pounds. My sense of smell, everything smelled like secondhand smoke 24 hours. I had tinnitus as, uh, that, you know, on a scale of one to 10, it was a 50. It just sounded like a train was going through my brain all the time. Lost my taste of my sense of taste and it just incredibly nauseous. So, you know, from the balance stuff, you know, I, I look like a drunken sailor, a sailor on a cruise ship in a hurricane. You know what I mean? Like, whoa, Horton. You know what I mean? You're just, your brain is wobbly. It feels like brain Parkinson's is what it feels like. Mm. And so you can't drive and you can't work out. And you can't really eat. You can't function. You sleep all day. You get really depressed. And you take all these meds and, and they kind of don't really work. And then you get more depressed because it doesn't go away. It's like, like a cold or a flu or a broken bone. It just lingers and lingers and lingers. And of course, your income is affected because you can't do anything. And um, and then your wife's got to you know take care of you and bring you to the you know all the all the king's horses and all the king's men to put you back together again and and a lot of it was all caused by stress. I mean, I had friends of mine that were at the Vegas shooting and and the horror stories there are just mind bending. You know, they were right there in the middle of all that gunfire. And then my buddy Tom Petty died. I'd known Tom for thirty two years, and you know that was an accidental overdose, which was just a freaking nightmare. And then I was in the middle of beach body contracts and they, and they weren't, you know, they were without be, being too disparaging. I would thought what they were trying to do for me was incredibly unfair after 20 years of service. So it was a bad time. And so all that stress and stress is one of these, you know, intangibles. It's this amorphous energy that's happening around you. And, and you know, these external forces are creating these internal reactions and a lot of times you don't, you know, it's like the old frog in a frying pan. You don't, you're, you know, you put the frog in the pan and you turn the heat up slowly and it cooks itself. And that's what I was doing. I thought I was doing everything right. I was eating clean and I was exercising all the time, but my adrenal glands and my cortisol levels were through the roof. And I was, I was slowly screwing myself up. So a long, long recovery to make a long story. Good, Mark. It took me a long time. <laughs> to get my act together again. And my, and I have this really strong mindfulness practice. I left Beachbody. I have four jobs now instead of the one. And it's, it's a lot more work, but it's a lot more rewarding. And I'm making more, more money now than I was making with them for the last three years. So sayonara, baby. I mean, so this is all part of, you know, I have two mortgages, you know, and I have a, I have bills to pay. And I was not going to downsize. And I already had the wherewithal, the background, the knowledge, the fan base, <clears throat> and the gumption and the vim and the vigor to, to reinvent myself. Um, and I did. If, if we go back to the, to the point where you're, you know, you're being infected, affected by this, um, this, this disease, this, this issue you know, with your ear, with your, nerve, uh, with your nerves and what have you, how... <laughs> For someone who built a career on strength, on fitness, on health, what what does that what does that feel like? What does that do to you? Like like, did you slip? You said depression. Did you slip into hopelessness, or what? What was it in that time that kept you going through? Kept you driving forward? Kept you to the point now where you're on the other side of it or working through it? Well, I, I think I'm an optimist in general, regardless of how bad things were going. I always felt, I always assumed that it was just going to get better eventually. I was a little shocked and, and amazed by how long it took. I, if I had known what this was and I went in and I got, you know, some antiviral medication in my body immediately, I could have avoided the whole nightmare. And a lot of people don't know what they, I, I thought I had a stroke. So, so, you know, we're seeing people for that and they go, oh, that's not right. So with every passing hour, every passing day, the disorder got worse and worse and worse until we finally figured it out so they can get me on the right meds. But it was never hopeless. I wouldn't say it was ever hopeless. There were, there were points where, because there's, 
on the first time I'm going to swear at your podcast, because uh, I have to, there was a load of pain. Mm. I mean, a level, like a, just a level of physical pain in my head that caused me, you know, my whole system was shutting down. It was completely broken. And, and then, you know, every inkling of improvement, because it was infinitesimal at first. Infinite, am I saying that word right? Um, it was just, you know, little tiny bits, but oh my God, you just cling on to feeling a little, oh, like today I felt good for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Oh, I wasn't, I didn't throw up all day. You yeah. know what I mean? I had, a, I had, I was only throwing up. I only threw up five times today. You know what I mean? Vomiting is not my favorite thing. And, and uh, when you have that incredible stomach upset because your brain, you know, your head, it's just a strange thing. I'd rather have a flu or broken bone or, you know, I'd rather have a compound fracture of my forearm than, than this. It was, it was crazy. But when you started to see and feel improvements, you know, I, I was always pushing the envelope uh, when it came to the, to rehab or step. I mean, I remember getting on a, because I was always looking and I would walk by the gym and go, I can't, I can't get in there. I can't do anything. You know, I can't. And then one day I, I walked on the treadmill for three minutes and I had to go lie down for two hours. That was after I threw up a couple of times after walking on the treadmill for just three minutes. And I would be in a complete flop sweat. You know, I mean, it was, that's how broken I was. But then it started to improve. I mean, after about the third month, I mean, imagine being at death's door for three months. <laughs> it's just crazy, man. And, well, and the reason I asked if it if it was embarrassing is I, I have to imagine that a certain amount of your identity is is tied up in being, you know, Tony Horton. And, you know, you share a story where you can't even walk on a treadmill for more than three minutes without taking a two hour break. How how does that not how does that not affect how you think about yourself, who you are, your strength as a man, everything that you've done? Like like it just it bounced off you or or was it seeping in? I mean, I have a pretty big ego and I'm pretty insecure just because that's who people who are successful are. They're always trying to keep up with, with, with their past or their expectations of the future or what people expect of them. That's just kind of, you know, that's the nature of success, I think sometimes, but, you know, I was in such pain and misery that, that I was just trying to survive second to second. You know what I mean? It's like, you could like every second was chick, 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 you know what I mean? Like a week was a month and a month was a year just how it feels like because when you're in, you know, ask anybody who's got chronic pain, it, it's just relentless and embarrassment's not on the list for, th- you know what I mean? Who can, I, I, I completely ignored who I was and what I, what, what people expected of me. I didn't care. All I wanted to do was to, to survive and to be in less pain and get to the next day with the hope that all the stuff that I'm doing, all the pills and the potions and the tinctures and the acupressure and the punk and the, laryngologists and all the things. And pe- I was just trying to focus on showing up and helping improve my situation. I'm in the waiting room with a bunch of guys who just got back from Afghanistan and Iraq and, you know, they've been blown up. All right. So they got melted arms and missing legs and, and blown up faces and stuff. And so I'm, I'm, I got all my parts. I got a funky face and I went, Hey dude, you know, you, every once in a while you have to be reminded that, uh, you know, you're going to be all right. And there's a people around me sitting in the same room who are much worse shape than you are, dude. So shut the hell up, put on your big boy pants and get in there and, and do what this physical therapist tells you to do because you got to trust that she knows what she's doing. And, and then, you know, four months later, after the whole thing started, I went to Mammoth and tried to ski. And uh, it took me 15 minutes to get my ski boots on. Like everybody's like, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah. Why did you think that was a good idea? <laughs> ah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea <laughs> because I ran into a tree full stop. I hit a big old pine tree this big. <laughs> Cause I just wasn't like my reaction time was off. You know, I was starting to walk the, the ringing in my ears was gone. I could eat food again, you know, but I was still, I still had the vestibular thing where, you know, I always felt like I was on a, on a cruise ship in a hurricane and so I hit a tree and I, I almost broke my femur. I uh, came really close. Didn't break, but I had a bruise. It went from my hip all the way down to my ankle. The blood just was crazy. That's just kind of who I am. You know what I mean? If, there, if, there's a, if there's a teeny bit of energy inside of me, I'm going to take advantage of it and I'm going to go. I, I'm curious, you know, at, at this point, in, you know, in your early 60s, 
does it feel different? Does does it does it feel different to be in, at this point in your life versus say ten years ago or twenty years ago? Well, no, I, I have a bunch of T-shirts that I sell based on whatever silly things that I say, and one of them was "Aging is for idiots," which is a little bit irreverent. But you know what I'm trying to say is, aging is for people who aren't willing to put in the time and the effort to slow it down, or aging is for people who want to, don't want to make the same mistakes as their parents and ancestors, so that things turn out really horribly, like with most people. But that's a little wordy on a T-shirt. So, aging for idiots is kind of a uh, an irreverent way of saying, hey, if you're willing to learn how to slow that down, because, you know, there's biological aging and there's num- numerical aging. You can't, that's nothing, you know, you can lie to people and you can change the number on your license or something. But in reality, you know, there's a myriad, a cornucopia, a panoply of things that you need to do. And they have to be a priority. They can't be something that you do on occasion. They have to be they have to be the foundation of who you are as a human being to be able to look and feel differently than everybody else in your age group as you move into your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. <clears throat> and I do all of them. I do all of them consistently. And it wasn't like I was a overweight, cocaine snorting, alcohol drinking, unemployed, cigarette smoking, uh, curmudgeon. Uh, and they woke up one day, read a couple of personal development books and said, well, let's just flip that 180 degrees and be a different guy. This is decades of, oh, you know, messing with my diet, messing with my workouts and and learning about mindfulness and the, and the importance of that and and, and, and kind of getting rid of the, the chaff in your life, the people who are more like anchors than they are anything else. So, you know, being having those conversations and then searching for a, a better group of people who want to, you know, kick ass and take names. <clears throat> There's all this stuff takes time and you have to be willing to do it, do it. And none of it's easy. None of it's easy. It's all, yeah, it takes effort. Like, Oh, I'm a meat eating guy and, uh, and cheese and dairy. And I tons of food. that's not, I processed McDonald's, you know what I mean? You don't just go from that to vegan in, in 24 hours. There's, you know, there's stages and you have to be okay with the fact that, you know, everybody, everybody wants everything now. You know what I mean? And the, the, then what you're doing, if that's your mindset, A, it's not going to work. And B, you're not going to enjoy the journey because there isn't one. Right? The whole thing is the, this, this, this earth, why birth, birth, school, work, death. That's it. All right? You got taxes, but There's man. stuff in taxes. between. <laughs> right? There's taxes. But, you know, you're, you're, you're born, you go to school, you go to work, and then you die. And in between is when you're, you should still be learning. After high school or college, most people are done, right? They have their tribe, half of them are assholes, but they're okay with that. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Either you have, a, you have a fixed mindset or you have a growth mindset. Fixed. I'm done. This is me. I'm not, I don't want to learn any more stuff. I got a house and I have children. I have a wife. I, you know, I have, I have a car, you know what I mean? I'm, so I'm overweight. So I, the escalator goes out and I got two suitcases and it's like climbing Everest to get to my flight. Okay. You're all right with that? Me, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk up the escalator with, with a suitcase on my feet, on my hands. All right. I'm going to make it interesting. <clears throat> but most people like their world goes, right. They're looking through a buttonhole for the, for the last 30, 40 years of their life. Hideous. Not me. No way. No thanks. Right. So you have to continue to, you know, get uncomfortable and meet new people and try new things and and have a story because, you know. 63, I don't know how that happened. I was watching Chinatown the other night. That movie was made 1974. Yeah, before I remember I was, I was in high school and I watched uh, Faye Dunaway and Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson. Give me the bat, Wendy. I'm not going to hurt you. <clears throat> Here's Johnny. Anyway, you're like I was like 74. 84, 94, 2004, 2014. Holy smokes. Like, I'm going to be 73 in about 45 minutes. <laughs> so I better do all the right things so that between 63 and 74, you know what I mean? I'm not a sad, old curmudgeon, you know, because what happened, a lot of the people, my peers are dying. Yeah. Oh, so-and-so passed away. 63 years old. I mean, but this is it. Between 60 and 80, people start dying. And I'll go look at photos of friends of mine who are my age and I'll go, that's my father. It looks like my father. You know what I mean? It, whatever. So I don't go in the sun. I drink a crap load of water. I cover myself in sunscreen every day. I get nine hours of sleep. I tape my mouth at night. I put a breeze right on my nose. <clears throat> I meditate 
before I go to bed, after I get up, in the middle of the day, while I'm driving a car, you know what I mean? And, wh- and if I have a if I have bad mojo with somebody, I just call them up and I go, hey, man, you and I have had a problem. And I, I'm I'll, whatever I said, whatever you forget it. I can't hold on to that energy because that's what gave me Ramsey Hunt in the first place. So, I mean, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to party with you, right? but it just means, you know, you got you got to just like people hold these. You did that with a lifetime. It's nuts, man. You did that with Beachbody. No, I haven't done it with Beachbody yet. <laughs> I haven't done I, and the only reason I ask is because you, <laughs> you know, like, well, working through some things or what have you. Still working it out. Not perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're going to get I there. Mean, You're going to get the place where you can call and be like, I'm letting this go. Yeah. Yeah. And but by the way, uh, busted. I, I appreciate that. I pre because, yeah. Yeah. There's still some mm, ill will there for me a little bit. Um, so, yeah. That's the most important thing. Reason why you and I got, because I got to let that go. I got to let that go. Well, I, listen, it's, it's super easy for me on this side By of the, the way, screen. This just turned into a therapy session. Did you notice that? Like <laughs> nice therapy for Tony happened just like that. By the way, I'm not kidding. That's that's a, that's a powerful moment for me right now. You know, I, mean, I got to let all that go. That's what we do here on the podcast. <laughs> we look for those powerful moments. Now, I have to imagine that Tony spent a lot of time reflecting on the setbacks and the challenges and the losses that he faced. After all, it really is natural for us to do that. But looking back at the man Tony was before the Vegas tragedy, before the loss of his friend Tom Petty, before the Ramsey Hunt syndrome and losing his contract with Beachbody and all of that stuff, if he looked back at the man he was versus the man he is today, I wanted to know, what did he learn about himself? As horrible as all that was, I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am now if it hadn't happened. I'd be much more stressed out, but but thank God for all of it. I mean, I, w- I wish I could have skipped the Ramsey Hunt because I still have a mild form of the, the uh, vestibular issues. That comes and goes. I'll have a whole month where it's fine and then it's bad for three days, which is kind of a bummer but whenever it whenever it kind of rears its head again it's a reminder that uh oh you know i i have the tools now to deal with it you know i, I go light on i take a nap I, I i just turn off the lights and for five or ten minutes you know what i mean these are things i wasn't doing before i was just you know what i mean i was just going and uh, and reacting and not forgiving and and pushing and overtraining and dehydrated and and all you know what I mean because I wasn't drinking enough water you know I mean for who I am and, and what I try to disseminate I wasn't always practicing what I preached you know and and now I do because I have to because if I don't I can get sick again and so very I mean look at with B, I have my own supplement line with my picture and name on it, something I've always wanted. And if I had hung in there with them, I don't, I wouldn't have had that. Right. I work for tonal now, which is this amazing company that was this, uh, this piece of equipment. It's from the future. And I have the, you know, there's dozens and dozens of trainers. And as a 63 year old presently, hard to say, mine are yeah. the most popular. Things. Yeah. You have the number, you have the number one on the platform. Possibly. Yeah, you know, so that's cool, man. It's like, good boy. You're still, you still got it. You know what I mean? The whole experience, getting that sick, finding the bottom, the absolute bottom, puts me in a place that is much better than, than where I was prior to all that. So, you know, a lot of people kind of will commit suicide. There's a lot of people who get, who get Ramsey Hunt syndrome and never get better and, and commit suicide because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And sometimes for a lot of them, because it's so severe, you know what I mean? Their life is altered forever. Um, but you either, I mean, there's a, there's a gentleman who got it up in Canada. I think, are you, are you from Canada, Mark? I am. I'm just outside I of Toronto. Tell by the, oh yeah, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I can hear it. it I can hear it. it, it no, come oh, on. Up there, oh yeah. The Pope's up there on a, in a boat smoking dope and on a yeah, rope, that, you know. Um, <laughs> terrible. Okay. Terrible accent. Terrible. I, I apologize. But yeah, I mean, this young kid got it really bad, and he was a he was a paddleboard instructor, and and uh, he got crushed, and and he's winning awards based on on his public speaking and his book, and 
and it was a real struggle for him and uh, probably tougher than mine. You know, he still struggles, I think, more than I do at this stage. Uh, and he came to me because he was like, how many, am I, this is such an odd thing. Nobody else knew what it was. And he found me and he and I've had, you know, multiple conversations. And I, you know, I was like, oh, wow, I can mentor this guy through this thing. And I was glad to be able to help a little bit, but really it was all him. I mean, he did the work and now he's, you know, before he had a little paddle boarding business up, up in, I think in Toronto somewhere. And now he speaks to, he's got this online presence and he speaks to all these folks and he's, he's a great motivator for people who, you know, who are also struggling, maybe not with Ramsey Hunt syndrome, but with just about anything. And so he's- And, and what's his name if people want to check him out? I, oh my God. I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. Oh, then sorry. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just Google- uh, Yeah, Google- Toronto uh, uh, paddle boarding. Paddle board instructor with, with Ramsey Hunt syndrome. He'll come up. I'm going really? to do that right now during our Toronto Ram- Mike Shorman. Correct. Ha. So, That's so the correct. keywords, Toronto paddle board, Ramsey hunt speaker brought a, a nice article from the Toronto star transforming pain into triumph. Whippy man. So just so you know, Whippy is about a three minute drive from where I live. Uh, so I'm in the next town over. Uh, yeah, his name is Mike Shorman. Mike's going to hate. He's going to see this and goes, okay, forgot my name. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, that's the one thing you can blame age, age on. Senior moment, right? You know, whatever. Senior moment. My Oh, my goodness. My wife's grandfather used to say that all the time. Mm-hmm. Senior moment. And he'd you know, also I say- I never used to in my 40s, but now I do. He'd also used to say, now hear this. Now hear this. And he would really? make, and then you'd make a proclamation. It was, it was amazing. Well, he, he's, here, here, here's a fun one. Uh, you know, because of all the crazy Tony Hortonisms, there's a couple- um, and their son, and uh, this, this, they wrote me this beautiful little note. And this gal said, "I met my, I met my husband by by doing P90X, and uh, he did a round, and uh, we met, and then while doing, he's, you know, we kind of met at some conference or something, and they started doing it together, and uh, fell in love during the course of their P90X journey. And she, she wrote in her note, she goes, "You're part of my love story." And now they have this amazing, this their son is uh, just a this amazing kid, and apparently they. They quote me all the time. <laughs> so I guess in the morning, and I didn't even know I said this. I don't even know which workout I said it in. That uh, she says that everybody get up in the morning and they look around and they say, "Everybody beautiful, <laughs> everybody beautiful." And I guess I said that in a workout. She goes, "Yeah, of course, synergistics at minute, you know, thirty nine <laughs> minutes and forty five seconds." I don't know where it was. So yeah, it's just crazy how things trickle down. You know, you said something a few minutes ago, which just is so striking, right? Like the idea that you wouldn't, you, that you've you grown a lot through this, that you wouldn't be where you were, um, that you wouldn't change things. People say that, and yet we're all so worried and fearful and anxious and stressed out about the future. And yet, you know, like like I always say to myself, because I still get worried about about workouts. I mean, I've, I, I actually get anxious about an upcoming workout. Can I do it? Can I push that hard? All of those types of things. And then I remember like, well, I've, I mean, I've gotten through every one I've ever, I've ever tried. There, there's never been a workout that I haven't gotten through. There's, there's never been a day at work that I haven't survived. There's never been, you know, a, a conversation that I haven't been able to get through. Every single thing that scares me, that worries me, that stresses me out, good or bad, I'm still here. And so, and yet, when I, when I think of the future, it still scares the shit me. <laughs> and I can't, I can't wrap my mind around the fact that looking back. It's all good, and looking forward, it's all scary as hell. Does does that do you bump up against that at all? Post post Ramsey Hunt, not as much. No, not as much. Okay. I mean, I, I've got this project with my wife, and everything's unpredictable. See, every every second, it's unpredictable. You know, I mean, there's certain things you know. You know how to flush the toilet. You know how to turn on the car. You know, you know how to heat up the food without burning down the house. There's certain things that you you can predict. But if you're an entrepreneur or you're somebody who's not working for the man. And you know what I mean, and you have, and you're and and you have to rely on on not only yourself but the people that you hire and that they're going to do the job you're going to do. There's you know there's it's your life is very unpredictable all, all the time, and that in theory can c- create more stress than the average person who has a more predictable life. You know, so like with tonal, right? We only got to get together. We got to figure out what the program is and how long the workouts are, what kind they are, and how long and how many days of the shoot, and and you know then I have to be you know. I have two days of rehearsal, then four days of shooting. And, and then I, can I predict, like yesterday, I had a, I was exhausted yesterday. I don't even know why. I didn't do anything extraordinary the day before. I just was dragging all day. 
and there was nothing I could do about it. You know, I wasn't somebody who's going to pop a bunch of pills to make it better. I, I meditated more than I normally do, but it didn't really help very much. So that's disconcerting. But I thought to myself, what if I was supposed to be on the set today? And I was said, hey, everybody, Tony Horton here. Boy, you're going to love this routine. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to pump some iron. Welcome to 30 Max Crush Muscle Destroyer. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I would have had to just take co- I, Who's got the cocaine? I'm not going to be able to do this today. You know what I mean? So timing is everything. And it, it's it's scary out there. So, you know, John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full Catastrophic Living, you know, James Nestor's book, Breath, that's all I had. I just said, okay, which of these meditations am I going to do? So some tape, sometimes you have the energy and enthusiasm to just attack. And other days, it's so overwhelming, you can't even organize your sock drawer, you know? And, and I, I'm probably mildly bipolar. I have, you know, ADD, ADHD, LMNOP, NYPD Blue. I got all the acronyms, man. You know what I mean? That's part of my genetic DNA. But, you're, um, but, but you forgive yourself now, do you? Like now post syndrome. Yeah. On a day like yesterday where you're not living up to your standards, you're not living up to it was, it was what it was. Things it was would like go. That. You're just more forgiving. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't, um, I can't get blood out of a turnip, you know, and I couldn't, so it wasn't going to happen. So I was, so, and here's the funny thing. Like I would normally take a nap because I felt like I, but I didn't go, like, oh, this is a weird feeling. I don't feel like I need the nap, but I don't really have the energy to solve any problems today. So it's just kind of, this, it's like, you know, life presents these new scenarios, these unpredictable scenarios, and you just have to do what you think you can do. And for me, it's, it's an Epsom salt bath, it's foam rolling, it's going for a walk, it's, it's, uh, it's taking a, you know, a cold shower, there's, you know, or it's the meditation, of course, or it's just playing with my dogs. You don't, you, know, you don't, do you, do you, do you have any guilt or shame spending that much time doing all of those things? Like, you know, I think, I think for many of us, I was in, I started my business in 2006. I was 23 years old. I got so caught up, even, even over the last year, like me working out during business hours still kind of bothers me. It feels like it, like, even though I know how much better I feel and how much better I look and how much energy I have and how much better I perform, you know, the thought of like working out during business hours feels like, like I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm robbing cheating. the company. I'm cheating. Exactly. Like, so you just listed off a whole bunch of, you know, you take a nap if you need energy and you all, I, I may know that they're the answers. Many of us may, but there's just too much guilt or shame or worry wrapped into like, into giving ourselves that time and the permission to do it. Well, you're 38. Yeah. So you're an ambitious young kid who's overthinking things that you don't need to overthink. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You need to forgive yourself. Like, you know, you schedule it, right? You schedule it. And if you if your workout is at 11 a.m., then that's when it is. And you don't schedule anything else. And that way you're consistent because consistency is one of the keys to getting, you know, results. It's in the book, the big picture that I wrote, right? So you just got, you know, you got to stop beating yourself up. You got to stop being attached to the outcome. You got to, you know, you got to show up. You got to get uncomfortable. You got to open up new doors. You, you know what I mean? And for me, like my workouts used to be at 7 a.m., and I'm thinking, well, why am I doing that? Why don't I make it at 830 and I'll just move everything forward? You know, as long as I get in the podcast and the emails and the phone calls and the meetings and the Zoom things and the, and the shoot dates, then I just I told my assistant, I said, nobody, I don't want to hear from anybody between 830 and 1030. So I give myself two hours. The workout's an hour, hour plus. But then I just, you know, I'll fold some laundry or I'll have a nice shake or I'll just chill out, you know. Yeah. For you, so last question for you, while sure. I have you. Um, for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Uh, joy and happiness and laughter. That's really it. I mean, the pursuit of happiness is in the constitution here in the United States of America. And we all think it's just a pursuit of power, money, and fame, right? Now, everybody, where's my phone? Everybody has their 15 minutes of fame, but the 15 minutes of fame turn into never ending pursuit of that. You know what I mean? And and, uh, you know, what, what does power, money, and fame do? It turns you into a more exaggerated version of who you kind of already are at your core. You know what I mean? So, so I remember when, I, when the money started coming in and I was poor, 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 and, I'm rolling, and I, I was like, well, let's go to Barney's. You know what I mean? What, is that a Mercedes? I mean, you know, I pulled a whole Wesley Snipes, MC Hammer thing, you know, early on. Then I got a financial advisor that said, stop. So, you know, I, you know. You, you may, you know, especially when it kind of you go from nothing, nothing to something. 
then, you know, you start making these goofy mistakes and you start thinking that you're really important and you start becoming an arrogant a-hole and, and, you know, and there's a lot of people who, you know, I mean, look at it. All you have to do is open up the paper every day, actors, politicians, musicians, you know what I mean? They, they peak and then they, and then it's hell after that. There's very few that sort of, you know, you know, the names, the Tom Hanks of the world, the, the Ron Howards of the world, the people who are like, wow, with all that fame and all that money and all that power, they're better than ever. You know what I mean? And it's hard to find. And then, especially in this town where I live, man, you know what I mean? So, you know, you have to get yourself back down to earth. It's about love and honesty and truth and authenticity and joy and happiness and laughter. Man, that's, that's the bottom line right there. Joy, happiness, and laughter. As a guy who's faced his share of false starts and setbacks and losses and tragedies, it's worth paying close attention to the fact that he said he would do it all over again, that he's happier on this side of facing those hard things. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, everyone is so busy trying to fit in and be like everyone else. Tony wants to stand out like a sore thumb. Of course, this not only takes courage, but you've got to level up your skills and stop focusing so much on the outcome. Number two, Tony, the guy hundreds of thousands of people turned to and held up as the example of health was getting himself all jacked up on stress. So whether it's Tony's story that inspires a change in your life or any others that we've covered here on the podcast, part of leveling up your life is prioritizing your health your emotions, and aligning your schedule to your goals. It's not like we're going to have a stress-free life, but you don't want to wait until you're sick to stop ignoring the important things in your life. And number three, when I asked Tony about the Las Vegas shooting, about losing his friend, about losing his contract with Beachbody, about getting sick, it turns out a few years later, he wouldn't even change it even if he could. And that's the game that we need to learn to play up here in our heads. Because if you look back, you wouldn't change anything. And then if that's the case, you have to ask yourself the question, why do we waste so much time fearing the things that are ahead of us? If looking back, we wouldn't change anything, then why do we waste time looking forward? Now, if you're ready to attack the next big thing in your life, you are going to need to develop the courage that comes from facing the hard things, big and small, in your life. It's not easy, but I want you to remember that we, we aren't just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. How did the son of a legendary film director and friend of the man who played Obi-Wan Kenobi go from being a house painter to somehow launching a television career that took him around the world with Ewan McGregor? Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring story.